I think a lot of students fall into the thing of like, hey, I'll just watch the video. The video makes sense. Why don't I remember? I watch the video. It makes sense. Why am I getting the questions wrong? It's because it never really stuck to begin with. George, welcome back to the MCAT podcast. How you doing? Good, good. How are you? I am excellent. I'm excited to talk with you today about a topic near and dear to my heart, uh, and that is taking notes when it comes ah. to MCAT prep and probably uh, also related to classes and, and stuff yeah. that students are taking. There are a lot of ideas out there, um, and I, I think some research studies as well that show that actively taking notes increases the retention of information. Mm. And so students often take that advice and they go, okay, I'm taking notes. <laughs> and they're basically creating scripts of everything that they're hearing, listening, watching, reading, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes that is a hindrance and sometimes it's not. I know your favorite answer is there are no absolutes, but what are your yes. thoughts uh, when it comes to <laughs> taking notes, my friend? There are no absolutes, <laughs> but I think it really comes down a lot to the nature of the notes that you're taking and how you're going to use them. So the way that I always think of it is that I understand the sentiment of wanting to create a resource that you're going to periodically like revisit. I understand the sentiment of I see something for the first time. I know it might not stick 100%. So I want to create something that I can look back on in case I need to refresh my memory. I get it. But the issue with taking notes is that I think a lot of the studies when they say that, oh, yes, taking notes are helpful. They, a lot of the time they, they talk about handwritten notes. But even for me, I'm biased towards the sense that I don't think it's the handwriting necessarily that is useful. It's the fact that when the lecturer is talking, they're speaking, and they're going at you know a mile a minute with, their, with the words, you're actively thinking about what they're saying, and you're, trans you're transforming it into a briefer, more succinct version that you can then refer back to later. You're thinking about it, you're integrating it, and then you write down some notes for yourself. The issue is that in today's world where we have everything's kind of online and you're taking notes on the side, a lot of it's typing. And typing is relatively quick. It's quick enough that you can write down most of the thing the person says, but it's not quick enough that you can, most people can just type, like you maybe need to slow down the video, you need to pause the video, you need to write down what they say. The danger with that is that it becomes super passive, okay? When we watch a video, for example, you can watch it and you can go, oh yeah, this makes sense. This concept's so cool. Sure, it makes sense. That example makes a lot of sense. Here's an easy question that makes sense. But then that is in, in one way already a form of passive learning. If you see the pause, like type notes, pause, type notes, pause, type notes, you might think, oh yeah, I'm creating a resource for myself. I'll refer to it later and all this. But it's still passive. If you're just transcribing, you're literally copy and pasting what the person's saying. Mm. You're not thinking about it at all. So the content isn't sticking. You're just spending more time on something that you're probably not going to reread anyways, right? Mm. So when it comes down to taking notes and taking notes efficiently, it really begs the question of, well, what do you plan on doing with these notes? You can make the notes useful for you. And I guess we can chat a little bit about strategies of how to take better notes or finding ways to create better resources for yourself. But it really should not be a transcription because that's where I do see students in my live course where it's like, George, I watched the, the videos. The video says it should be an hour, but it takes me double or triple the amount of time because I'm pausing, typing notes, pausing, typing notes, pausing, typing notes, all these long notes, formatting my notes. And then that's discouraging because I had a goal of doing three modules today, but I only got through one because it took me three hours instead of one hour. And it's like, well, let's take a step back and actually ch chat through that because how can we make that more optimized for you? Yeah. So I I almost think there's a very big similarity here between what, what you're discussing in terms of if you're just taking kind of verbatim notes mm -hmm. and, and you're not adding in any sort of interpretation and, mm -hmm. and, and other stuff from your own brain into what you're mm -hmm. writing down. I see mm -hmm. a big similarity there between that and taking the MCAT. You often talk about um, the ability to take a question, reinterpret it into your own words, mm -hmm. and then try to come to a conclusion of like, here's the answer that I think is, is going to be the answer, and then looking. Mm -hmm. Do you see a similarity there between 
potentially what students should do with note taking of like, here's what I heard. Here's how I'm going to reinterpret it and actually put it on the paper. Possibly. That is definitely one form of active learning. I think the biggest thing is if you're going to take notes, you want to leave some sort of resource for you that you produced in an active manner. Passive learning is again, transcribing, thinking like not really thinking about it, pause typing exactly what you say. But if you take a moment to think, what is a personal example that I could relate to this concept? And you like jot down a couple of keywords of that, that is meaningful. And you will remember that it's actually an MCAT uh, testable concept. We call it the self-referencing effect, where when you relate it to your own life, has more meaning, you remember it easier, right? So taking that moment to add a little bit of extra, or even if it's not even extra, even if it's like taking a moment to pause the video instead of typing things out, because honestly, I'm a slow typer as well. Like the Casper test was such a nightmare for me because I could not type for my life. But the taking a second, uh, second to pause the video and just be like, okay, we just talked about the Hardy Weinberg principle. Here are the five conditions. You close your eyes and you say it out loud for yourself. Number one, uh, you know, random mating. Number two, there's no genetic drift. Number three, like you say it out loud for yourself. When you do that, that becomes an active form of learning, right? You actively almost quiz yourself to say, okay, I'm going to become the teacher now. I'm going to say it out loud. I'm a, gen I'm a genuine believer that the more modalities you, you engage in your learning, the easier it is to remember. Like literally what I'm learning, it's, it's the craziest thing because I'll be saying it out loud. I'm like using my fingers to like interpretive dance it. I'm closing my eyes and I'm explaining it. It's not just reading it off a screen. It's not just one modality where you're using your eyes. It's like you want to see it, you want to speak it, and you want to kind of act it out. The more things that you can do to remember remember that concept, the more the neural networks activate in your brain to remember that concept. And so active learning is really important. When you finish watching, let's say within a module, you finish one little section, you can take a step back to say, okay, I'm going to explain it out to myself again. You can also jot down some prompts for yourself. I know we, we refer a lot to like, you know, asking questions instead of taking notes, taking questions. It's like, what are the five principles of Hardy Weinberg equilibrium? And then bullet one, two, three, four, five. With when you take bullets as well, you can also leave them as prompts for yourself for later, where when you revisit this topic, you can talk it, you're, talk yourself through it again. Like, let's say you're, you're studying the respiratory system. Instead of taking a, a very detailed list of things of like, here's where the nose is, here's the functions, here's where, the, you know, the, the function of the epiglottis, and, you know, here's, it goes down to the trachea, the airways, and this, that. You can leave keywords for yourself. You can just be like key, like, uh, key anatomy. And you can write things like, like mouth, um, esophagus, trachea, epiglottis, you can write these keywords out for yourself. And then when you revisit this resource, it's not just rereading, like rereading a textbook. It's like, okay, what does the epiglottis do? Oh, what does the trachea do? And you talk yourself through it again. And if something doesn't stick, then maybe that's when you would go and jot down some other bullets. But the danger that a lot of students get into is you're writing down things that either already make sense to you, or things that you're never going to revisit again. And that's just wasted time. Because I also had like, even in med school, when I started med school, I was writing a handwritten notes. I think it was actually the best example was Orgo 2. I tried writing things like handwriting, everything out, making it neat, color coding. And I realized after the first lecture, I was, this is so inefficient. So you print out the slides and you annotate on top of it. You write a couple of things, keywords, really thinking about what are the key takeaways, you write them down. And then that's what you use your, your resource of like, what is this pathway? What is this example? Is there another example I can think of, right? Finding more ways to make it active. And that of course goes into later, do practice questions, find other ways to incorporate your learning, applying it, not just regurgitating it. Like you need to find ways to make active learning active. You need to engage yourself with the learning. You need to find ways to pull it back from memory. You can read something a million times without remembering it. If you pull it back from memory two to three times, it will be there for you on test day. That's what I always say when it comes to remembering things. So one of the, um, the strategies I've seen, uh, it, of, of students sitting around a dining room table with stuffed animals mm -hmm. and, and teaching the animals topics. Sure. Uh, do you see potentially a replacement? Like instead of pausing and taking notes, I'm going to pause mm -hmm. and talk to my stuffed animals to to tell them what I think I just heard, right? Very common uh, strategy of, of active listening when you're having a conversation. Uh, you hear psychologists use this all the time. It's like, what I think I just heard you say was, right? And then yes. re repeating it, uh, potentially doing that is like, Here's what I heard the professor say about this amino acid, blah, 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 blah. Right. The classic thing we hear in medicine too is learn one, do one, teach one, where yep. it's like you see someone else do it and then you try it yourself and then you teach it to someone else. Teaching yep. is actually a very high level of learning because you need to understand a concept enough that you can reword it into your own 
words and language and examples, and then give that as a concrete piece of information to someone else. So is it necessarily the stuffed animal that's the magic sauce here? No, but it's the ability to take a step back and be like, I'm going to make a conscious effort to integrate this knowledge and then regurgitate it out loud. Really force my brain to say, did I really understand that? Or is it like I'm explaining and I'm like, wait, that actually doesn't really make sense. Or like that actually doesn't quite line up or I don't really remember that detail. When you start to identify those gaps, that's when you're like, okay, let me revisit. Oh yes, yes, that was the thing. And then you refine it more. I think a lot of students fall into the thing of like, hey, I'll just watch the video. The video makes sense. Why don't I remember? I watch the video. It makes sense. Why am I getting the questions wrong? It's because it never really stuck to begin with. And that's not a testament to your, your learning ability or your mind because nobody understands something from the first time just watching a video. It does take a bit of conscious effort to really integrate, to encode it in your brain and finding the strategy whether it's speaking it out loud, whether it's doing practice questions, whether it's a combination of both, whether it's doing like any sort of quiz, gaming, flashcards, anything, saying it out loud, finding some way to actively recall that information will really help it to stick. What are your thoughts on trying to think like a test writer and and hearing mm. information and going, okay, I, uh, I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to mm. interpret what I just heard. And now mm -hmm. I'm going to think about five questions that potentially can come from this. Right. We actually have uh, in our medicine class, our, our medical class, um, she's she's amazing. We have uh, a student who basically makes a quiz for us like at the end of every block. Like she designs her own questions. She's She used some help from ChatGPT now, which is like obviously <laughs> leverage your resources, but she's been writing questions and I'm sure for her, that's a very high level of learning because mm -hmm. you're thinking from the other side. It's like, yes, this is the content, but how are you expected to see it? You could definitely do that as a form of learning. Now, the issue is, of course, this is also why we recommend, you know, save your AMC tests for the very end, because that's going to be gold standard. That's how the AMC is going to test your logic. You might get into a pool of where your logic isn't quite on, uh, on track. You still memorize certain concepts and it does help. But of course, you want to supplement with actual tests like practice at some point. So one of the things that I always recommend for my students is... When you finish watching the module, pause in between, say it out loud, then immediately dive into test like practice, right? So in Blueprint, we have the, the, the Q bank, you can, um, so like the question bank, you can choose by topic, by section on all this. It's like, I just watched the module on learning and memory. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into the Q bank. I'm going to make five to 10 questions, discrete questions about learning and memory, because you're going to start recognizing how the MCAT will test these questions. Like, yes, come up with your own questions. That's a great form of learning, but you also want to learn how they're going to test it. A lot of students, myself included. There are moments where I'm like, I try a question. I'm like, I have no idea what to do. I have no idea how to approach it. Then I read the explanation and I'm like, I knew this concept. I knew this equation. I knew the content itself. I remembered it, but I just didn't know how to apply it in this case. I didn't recognize I was supposed to use it in this case. I didn't recognize that based on these givens, this is the equation I should have used. That's a skill called priming. And you only recognize priming by recognizing how the MCAT will test you. And there's a, a lot of students always say, oh, you know, I want to get through the content. I don't want to do practice. I want to get through the content. I don't want to do practice. You're shooting yourself in the foot because yeah. you're going to get to practice and you will know the content but you're not going to know that's when you need to apply it. The best approach you can take is see the content, integrate it, say it out loud, write prompts for yourself. And then from there, dive into practice, test like practice to see how am I going to be tested on this? Because again, mile wide, inch deep, right? You don't need to know the advanced mechanism, electron pushing all this, but you should be able to recognize when uh, an alcohol group becomes a ketone group. You should be able to recognize when there's certain transitions between functional groups, whatever it may be. So finding that balancing point of like, oh yeah, okay, well, I don't need to worry about these details. Maybe I'm familiar with it, but I don't need to worry about these details, but I should know this broad category. I should know this kind of thing. I should know this type of question. It's like, that's how you're likely to be tested on it. And you only recognize that when you do targeted practice after content. When you say test like practice, yes. to me, we, we always talk about, right, you're, you're taking a full length in a, a test like mm. environment with timing. Mm. You're not saying go, go learn about some amino acids and then go sit for seven and a half hours in a test like it practice. What do you, what do you specifically mean by that? Right. So what I mean by that is that the MCAT has a certain logic, right? It's a, it's a, it's very much an application exam. So even though you might remember, you know, alanine, it's a nonpolar amino acid. Well, there's more to it than that. Alanine is an amino acid, which as a molecule is actually polar. It has a, an amino group, it has a carboxylic acid group, and then it has an R group. The only thing that's nonpolar about alanine is that it's 
the R group that's different. And we classify amino acids based on their, um, their R chains, what makes them different. So the MCAT might ask you something about, hey, look, you know, in this passage, we talked about alanine. Um, what is like the properties of alanine as like a zwitter ion in water or something? It's like basically asking you, what is the properties of alanine as a molecule, not its side chain? The correct answer would actually be it's a polar molecule. It's a small polar molecule because it has that amino group and has that carboxylic acid. But our, our minds might gravitate towards flashcard knowledge of, oh, alanine, nonpolar. Yeah, classic. I know this one. Easy peasy, right? But it's about the way that it tests you. The MCAT is very rarely going to say, give me just a definition. What is the, here's the concept. Give me an example. Here's the example. Give me a concept. Like it's, it's more than that. It's very application based. So when you look through content, it's like you could do the direct regurgitation questions of like, what is this concept or what is like this, an example of, or such and such. But when you start to see test like practice of based on this experiment, this is the results from these people. What psychological phenomenon is this? Or based on this experiment, it's like, yes, we understand certain concepts of experimental design, experimental techniques, and like blots and stuff. You understand the premise of it, go interpret a blot, right? It's the actual, the application of it that the MCAT will test you on. It's not just fill in the blank. What is the correct answer? Fill in the blank. What is the correct answer? It's not a content test. In a lot of ways, it's an application test. So figuring out tests like practices, getting yourself in a situation where you start to see what is the MCAT going to ask me about and how are they going to ask me about it? Not just regurgitating content, although that is important for memorizing it, sure. But the application is what I mean by the test like practice. How will you see it on test day? That is what you want to prepare for because you don't want to run into the situation of I know the content, I just didn't know to apply it in this situation because that's still uh, an answer that you didn't get. So George, as we wrap up here, when it comes hmm. to taking notes for the student again mm -hmm. no no absolutes but mm -hmm. i think what i'm hearing is we're not saying don't take notes we're right. saying take notes in a more strategic way actively and efficiently right think about what will be useful for you don't write notes ever for something you're like this makes a lot of sense already don't write any notes on it write down a couple of key terms key bullets and then look at it later and think can i explain this to myself if you can explain to your pet animals or your, your stuffed animals whatever it means you can explain it you're on top of it Great, happy days, don't write anything more. If you ever need to revisit the topic, talk yourself through it again, right? Remember it uh, again, and then do tests like practice. But if you write down a list of things and you're like, hey, I, something didn't quite stick, then maybe consider, I'll rewatch the video, I'll jot down some extra bullets, give myself some more detail. You want to be efficient. Efficiency is your best friend with something long, like the MCAT prep journey. You want to maximize your sanity and maximize your working time. So remember that efficiency and opt time optimization are the most important.